I'm very honoured to present this video letter today. It's an open letter to the Christian paranormal community and it's on behalf of the main author Mark Honeman, Dana Emmanuel and myself. Mark and Dana are authors, radio guests and actively involved in the deliverance ministry. Dana is herself an ex-ghost hunter and I am Laura Maxwell. I'm a radio and TV guest, radio host and an ex-New Age spiritualist. All three of us are actively involved in the Deliverance Ministry and we really just want to share our loving concern with you today about issues with regards to the Christian paranormal investigation community. Thank you so much for watching and any inquiries and comments please do send to Mark Honeman. His details are at the end of this video letter. Thank you so much for watching. This is an audio version of an open letter to Christian paranormal investigators. Preface. This is a humble and heartfelt plea to Christian paranormal investigators from Mark Hunneman, who initiated and drafted this communication, and Laura Maxwell, who is a former spiritualist, and Dana Emanuel, a former ghost hunter, who support the statement and added invaluable insights as well as there are 60 signatures at the bottom of people who support this. From 1 Corinthians 10.31, it says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And 1 Peter 1.16 says, be holy for I am holy. Quote, if I profess with loudest voice and clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God, except Precisely that little point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I am not professing Christ, however boldly I may be professing Christ. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. And to be steady on all fronts of the battle front besides is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that point. This is attributed to Martin Luther. In our day, that little point is our obedience to the inerrant word of God in response to the onslaught of the pagan occult worldview and techniques which have infiltrated the church. As the New Testament scholar Dr. Peter Jones has clearly shown in his book, The Other Worldview, the pagan worldview is the dom dominant enemy of the biblical worldview today. And as such, it is that, quote, little point where the devil is most fiercely attacking. The question is this. Will we be faithful, loyal soldiers for Christ in our generation? Or will we flee due to accommodating it? Or worse practicing it ourselves, that is, through occult methods. Fascination with the paranormal has mushroomed and has demonized the spiritual landscape of America and Europe. And if we don't respond quickly and appropriately, then our children and our grandchildren will not be ready for the difficult days ahead. Today, the church and the world are being besieged Indeed, there is an unprecedented disaster unfolding before our very eyes. And sadly, it involves Christians in the paranormal community. Hence, this letter is lovingly addressed to you. Many of the people who sign this are former paranormal investigators. And the three of us who wrote this are actively involved in helping people with demonic issues. So this is very, very practical to us. It's not an ivory tower reflection. We see it as our timely duty to write this declaration in light of the current lapses into the occultic beliefs and practices amongst our fellow believers and in the world at large. We offer this in a spirit of humility and love, 
with the hopes that it will stir further dialogue and change. We're all sinners saved by grace. Faith in a finished work of Christ on the cross plus nothing. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, and Romans 3 through 4. This is not an us versus them or you. It is all of us as Christians together. With a similar motivation that caused Martin Luther King Jr. to write his letter from a Birmingham jail to fellow Christians, we offer this letter of our beliefs and concerns to you, our dearest brothers and sisters in Christ. With tears, we must share that we feel Christians engaged in paranormal investigating are especially surrendering at this, quote, one little point, by the adoption of occultic beliefs and practices, which are opposed to the Lordship of Christ over the full spectrum of life, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, and the clear teaching of God's word, which has absolute authority over us and demands implicit obedience. The use of occultic pagan techniques in virtually all paranormal investigations is distressing to God and to us. Indeed, the solicitation of EVPs or other electronic equivalents has become the backbone of investigations. But the end justifies the means, or we are just trying to help people, are actually unbiblical forms of ethical reasoning that has infiltrated the paranormal community. As a former investigator, our friend Dana Emanuel has affirmed from her own experience. You could never truly help someone by disobeying God. Instead, you will hurt them and yourselves. God's curses and discipline are still in place, just as his blessings are. See Acts 5 verse 1, Corinthians 10 to 11 and Hebrews 12. God's truth and the work of Christ's church both insist that truth demands loving confrontation of both evil and error. What good is it for you to profess Christ ever so loudly and yet surrender at this point where the devil is attacking? What good is it it for you to affirm the full inerrancy of the Bible and a host of other biblical teaching if you're not living under the Lordship of Christ over the full spectrum of your lives, especially when it comes to the occult and how we interact with the spirit realm. It is this lack of obedience to Christ in a crucial area which we are lovingly confronting and asking you to repent of. Highlighted points. The singular honour and dignity of the Lord Jesus Christ and his all-sufficient and perfect atonement is our focus and passion. Certain beliefs and practices in the paranormal community either implicitly or explicitly deny the perfection of the person and work of Christ. Number one. When Laura Maxwell realized she was deceived some years ago by a group of Christians who all believed in the now popular global Christian trend that they were receiving revelation from alleged holy angels, she left that group and sought a deliverance minister. She repented and had demons cast out of her. Even after her many years in healing and deliverance ministry, she too had been deceived, but sought help. She shared this in a radio interview that she did with Mark last year on the topic of angels. Our point is, Nobody is above being deceived. Number two, occult practices are so thoroughly and consistently condemned in the Old Testament that it would take an explicit command in the New Testament to abolish them. Instead, the New Testament continues to express God's unchanging, implacable hatred of all occult beliefs and techniques. Please see Acts and Revelations. The best book on biblical ethics, law and gospel, law and grace, and the place of Old Testament moral law in the New Testament, etc., is John Frame's book, The Doctrine of the Christian Life. Number three, 
The clients don't need validation of something they already know is true. They need deliverance and conversion. If you are truly called by God, then you may consider deliverance as a vocation. Number four, testing the spirits in Jesus' name, along with praying for protection, will often be ineffective because God does not listen to us if we are engaged in heinous sins or cherish sin in our hearts. Please see Psalm 66, verse 18. Number five, basing beliefs primarily on non-biblical books, such as the book of Enoch, has become common, and but it must be avoided as it detracts from the sufficiency of scripture and has led to much unedifying speculation. For example, some take issue with our claim that all alleged ghosts are demons, and they frequently base their beliefs on extra-biblical texts myths, folklore, and other experience, none of which are infallible. Actually, they are all very fallible. Dana Emanuel used to be the team leader of a highly proficient paranormal investigation team and experienced severe oppression as a result, as are many of you. She is a vital part of drafting this letter, and there, here is a link to her, her testimony articles, which we, and I personally, highly recommend. It's X, as in a letter, exposing the enemy, exposingtheenemy.com. To view dozens of my own articles, Mark Hunneman on the paranormal, please see archive.aweber.com slash para world. And for many excellent articles and interviews by Laura Maxwell, a former spiritualist and daughter of a medium, and according to myself and many others, the world's leading experts in all things supernatural from a biblical perspective, her site is OurSpiritualQuest.com. We know that you, like we, ache and agonize over the spiritually hostile situations many people today are experiencing. Further, we know that many of you have given so much of your heart, time, energy, and finances to help folks in distress. We know many of you personally, and we love you and are in awe of your desire to help people. That is not the issue. The issue is this. Are the means by which you are attempting to help people honoring or dishonoring to God? There are no morally neutral acts, according to 1 Corinthians 10.31, which is really crucial to our view of this issue. I'll read it again. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. It kind of covers everything, doesn't it? Eating or drinking. Scripture has all of the divine words we need for every situation we face, including helping spiritually oppressed people. Every thought, every word, and every deed is either done to God's glory or to the glory of an idol. So how can we help people in spiritually hostile situations in a way that brings glory to God and not to an idol. Sadly, we know that you are not glorifying God with your actions, regardless of your loving motives. How can we be certain of that? Because God's word is clear, very clear, as we shall see. Because God's word is certain, it is possible to be certain and humble, or not arrogant. We despise and despair of any self-righteous judgmentalism, but we do speak the truth in love with the collective broken heart. Wanting to help people cannot be the sole judge of whether an action is morally right. Our actions have to conform to God's word and glorify him. Again, 1 Corinthians 10.31. Now, whether it makes us feel good certainly cannot be the determining factor of an action's propriety in God's eyes. Do 
to distressing life circumstances, some of you find your purpose or significance in helping others with paranormal problems. It's, it's all you think about. And that makes it all the more difficult for you to imagine life without it. However, as new creations in Christ, Galatians 2.20, you have to realize that such thinking is idolatrous. Please see Jeremiah 2.13 and, and read that. Christ and Jesus Christ alone can give us security and significance. Perhaps the greatest need in the church today is a keener grasp of God's burning holiness. A deficient understanding of God's holiness has led to moral laxness and a deficient view of both law and grace. God himself is our ultimate ethical norm, and he is unchanging, Malachi 3.6. We meet the incarnate word as we read his inscripturated word, which is the Bible. See, both are the word. Both are divine. Often we hear, but I've been involved in investigating for 20, 30, or 40 years. However, longevity in the paranormal field does not make one wiser, as many assume. Because the longer you are immersed in darkness, the more your mind will be affected with a spirit of demonic delusion confusion and obsession and your conscience will be increasingly defiled until it even becomes seared as Dana points out it happened to her even though she was loath to admit it at the time countless ex-investigators have confessed that they had become obsessed with the thrill of the hunt or the collection and review of the data Obsession is often a sign of demonic oppression or a step in that direction. There are many rationalisations and objections that folks raise against what we are saying, and we can't address them all today. But the issue is, will you have a soft, humble, teachable heart before God and bow before his absolute sovereign authority? Proverbs 1 Verse 7. If you hear nothing else in this open letter, please hear this text which was breathed out of God's own holy mouth. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 to 17. The following text from Deuteronomy comprises an indivisible unit in the Hebrew Bible. When you come into the land, that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you are about to dispossess, listen to fortune tellers and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do this. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name. I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name 
that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 9 to 25 If a person turns to mediums and necromancers, whoring after them, I will set my face against that person and will cut him off from among his people. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. This is in Leviticus 20, verses 6 and 7. God wants you to listen to his voice. He is the good shepherd, and not the voice of demons, whoring after them reveals the true nature of what you are doing in God's eyes. This is spiritual adultery. No, I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Please see 1 Corinthians 10, verses 20 and 21. By communicating with the spirit realm, which is the realm of Satan and the demonic, you are participating and communicating with demons and are provoking the Lord to jealousy and bringing unspeakable harm upon yourselves, which grieves us deeply. Your actions are affecting your children and grandchildren your future offspring. Generational curses are in the Bible, and we have dealt with them time and again in deliverance. Some of you are suffering in various ways because of your unwitting involvement with demons. We'd like to ask you a question. Are any parts of these texts, especially verses 9 through 14, unclear to you? Indeed, God's word is so clear that it leaves us without excuse. To make it in even plainer, let's put it in the form of a syllogism, which is common in ethical literature. Major premise. Attempting to speak to the dead is an abominable sin. Minor premise. Investigators attempt to speak to the dead, often electronically. Conclusion. Therefore, Investigators are committing an abominable sin. This syllogism is both valid and sound, and the conclusion follows irresistibly from the premises, and they, the premises, are true. It doesn't just say that the communicating with the spirit realm is abominable, but that those who do it become an abomination in his sight. That is frightening, is it not? In light of the manifest clarity of this text, why do Christian investigators still attempt to speak to the dead or use psychics, mediums? There is no excuse not done. However, here are several reasons why we did until our eyes were opened. And first we say with utmost gentleness, many of us, have been drawn to seeking the paranormal due to a, the traumatic death of a loved one. And our heart goes out to you if that happened to you. But you must resist this temptation because it will not help you and will only compound your pain by trying to reach out into the spirit realm. The devil is so cruel and he often takes advantage of us when we are most emotionally broken. The strongest believers can emotionally unravel in the face of tragic loss, and some of us deal with this agony on a daily basis. Perhaps you cling to this practice as it is the only thing that gives your life meaning. The second reason is that perhaps your conscience allows you to investigate. It doesn't bother you, so you assume it must be okay. However, the Bible doesn't see our conscience 
as being infallible. It is subordinate to Scripture. It is not uncommon for us to mute the voice of conscience by habitual sin. From personal experience, myself included, we know that it is possible to sink into devastating sin of all different kinds, not just paranormal, and the voice of conscience becomes increasingly dim. But we cannot remain in that situation indefinitely because Jesus says, He who perseveres to the end will be saved. Matthew 10, 22. Sometimes our conscience says that something is right when the Bible says it's wrong and vice versa. An example would be the discussion in Romans chapters 14 through 15. We must seek to inform or educate our conscience with the content of Scripture or it can and will lead us astray as the following text shows. Quote, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. It's 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 2. Third, many people think that the Old Testament laws, like the text in Deuteronomy are no longer binding under the new covenant and that the new covenant gives them new freedom to contact the spirit realm. I'm finding that this is probably the most common objection and we have come up with a long reply to this. But let me say this. False teachers in the church are promoting this antinomianism anti-lawism. We don't have the time to adequately defend what really should not need defending, and that is our comprehensive obedience to all, all of God's word. However, God is the author of both covenants. The covenant documents of each continue to be normative for God's people. Jesus indicates in Matthew 5, 17 and following, and Paul in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, that the Old Testament moral law, you see the civil and ceremonial law, have been fulfilled in Christ. But they're still normative and that they teach us as a guide. But the moral law is still a guide unto righteous living for new covenant believers. In Paul's text, he's referring mostly to the Old Testament and its abiding validity as a source for training us in godly living. The first generation Christians, that's all they had was the Old Testament. And it served them well. If the Old Testament law cannot justify or save us, which it never could, is it then obsolete for Christians? Do we just toss it out? Quite otherwise. As Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, Whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, verses 17 through 19. We can see how very clear Jesus is on this point. We are still obligated to obey God in the new covenant. Indeed, we are told over and over that our love for Christ is expressed through obedience to the law and commandments. Exodus 20, verse 6, Deuteronomy 11, verse 27, Daniel 9, 4, John 15, 4, John 14, 1, 1 Corinthians 7, 19, Revelation 12, 17. The law commands us to love, and that love commands us to keep God's commandments. 
Law requires love, and love requires law. A reckless disregard for God's law could be a sign of an unregenerate heart. The law of love has no content without love of the law. Some may cherry pick the few theologians who will support their attempts to circumvent Old Testament moral law, and indeed to circumvent the prohibition of communicating with spirits. Occult practices are so thoroughly and consistently condemned in the Old Testament that it would take an explicit command in the New Testament to abolish them. Instead, the New Testament continues to express God's unchanging, implacable hatred of all occult beliefs and techniques. See especially the books of Acts and Revelation. We do see this with all humility. If you have no qualms whatsoever about communicating with the spirit realm, then we suggest that you are either one, abysmally ignorant of scripture, or two, you're not a true regenerate Christian. Although you are a born again Christian, you are being disobedient and grieving the Holy Spirit. Thus, this is an exceedingly serious matter. Let us return again to Deuteronomy 18 and uh, just point out that that entire section quoted comprises a unity in the Hebrew text. The first half is devoted to illegitimate means of seeking spiritual guidance, which includes the abominable practices of seeking to communicate with the dead and the use of psychics and mediums. In other words, seeking wisdom apart from God and via occult methods. The second half of chapter 18 is devoted to the legitimate means of seeking God's wisdom via his prophets. Indeed, there is a messianic prophecy of the coming prophet, which is quoted about Jesus three times in the New Testament. John 1, 21, Acts 3, 22-24, and Acts 7, 37. Hence, if you reject Deuteronomy 18, verses 9-14, through 14, and its prohibitions against communicating with the spirit realm, then to be consistent, you would have to throw out the Messianic prophecy of Jesus as the coming prophet, because this text is in tight unit. Or if you object that you are not seeking illicit wisdom from the spirit realm, but com- confirmation of their presence, then we say that the method is as evil as the motive. Contacting the spirit realm is absolutely forbidden in itself. Do not consult medium psychics or attempt communication with the dead. Period. God tells us what will help us or hurt us, not our misguided attempts to help people by engaging in secretism, which is the mixing of beliefs and practices, the ban of God's church since its inception. Moses, who was educated in the in the magic of his day in Egypt, was contrasting how we are to find divine guidance and God's abhorrence of pagan and occult rituals. Please see Leviticus 19 verses 26, 1 Samuel 28, 2 Kings 17 and 17, Isaiah 2, 6, and Isaiah 2, 21, I'm sorry, Isaiah 21 verse 6, and Micah 5, 12, Revelations 21, 22, and all of the major prophets. As I said in my testimony, this is Dana, it was easy for me to soft pedal these verses by thinking that what I was doing was the right thing and perhaps that God would understand because the culture had changed drastically since then and possibly I thought that God himself had changed his mind. But then I realized that God does not change. He is immutable as Malachi 3 verse 6 tells us, that God's truth is unchanged and unchanging caused my change of heart. May it change your heart as well, and ours too, as we all struggle with idolatry. Specific points. Number one, it is out of love that we call our brothers and sisters 
to repent of beliefs and practices which God sees as spiritual adultery. Over and over and over and over in the major prophet, God exposes his heart regarding his holy and infinitely intense jealous hatred of paganism and occult activities and how much it tears at his heart. How can you read Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel and not be affected by the constant barrage of God's intense, jealous rage over occult practices such as you're doing? Entire reigns of kings in historical books, both northern and southern, Israel and Judah, were summarized as good or bad, depending on how they dealt with the occult. In one sense, Josiah was the greatest Old Testament king, and his zeal for God was manifested in how thoroughly he rid the nation of all occult practices. Quote, Moreover, Josiah put away the mediums and the necromancers and the household gods and the idols and all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, that he might establish the words of the law that were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. Before him, there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses nor did any like him arise after him. 2 Kings 23, verses 24 through 25. Please notice the very close connection between Josiah's unprecedented love for God and his love for Mosaic law and his putting away of mediums and necromancers. We lovingly challenge paranormal investigators to see their primary identity as children of the living God and part of his church, the body of Christ, and not primarily as members of the paranormal community. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 5, Galatians 3 to 4. God wants us to transform culture and not be conformed to it. Romans 12 verse 1 to 2. He wants us to be salt and light. Further, we believe that it is the paranormal community itself which is accelerating this individual and corporate disobedience due to it being a plausibility structure. Shared beliefs and passions make it easier to rationalise disobedience to God's clear commands and to believe things which are actually implausible. Two of the attributes of scripture are its sufficiency and clarity, and your lack of perceiving the clear truth is deeply concerning to us. The more deeply you become involved, the more of a deluding darkness takes hold of the reasoning process, where things that should be clear aren't. A dark veil has descended, and you can even begin to blame God for the distressing circumstances that your actions often bring about. God's discipline and or demonic oppression. And praying for protection or for discerning spirits in Jesus' name before or during an investigation will often be ineffective because God does not listen to us if we are engaged in heinous sins or cherish sin in our hearts. Psalm 66 18. Why, for example, would you pray to Michael for assistance or other angels when neither Jesus nor the apostles ever did that? Why pray to an archangel when God, the Holy Spirit, is infinitely stronger and present with us always? Angels do not want us to pray to them. It is actually a form of worship. And your request for discernment may well be blocked as well because of grieving the Holy Spirit who gives that discernment. Does it concern you as it does us 
that so many investigators are themselves plagued with demonic activity and are suffering in a multitude of ways, this is the deep, dark secret of the paranormal community. Specifically, we call our brothers and sisters to stop all attempts to communicate with the deceased by EVPs, ghost box, ovulus, etc. to not view oneself as a psychic or a medium, nor use psychics or mediums in investigations. It is disturbing to see the unbiased use of Christian mediums when that should be seen as an unholy oxymoron. You are utterly deceived if you believe God has gifted and called you as a medium. He has not. He does not speak out of both sides of his mouth. He doesn't condemn mediumship and then call one to it. It is a common error for folks to mistake their human spirit passions for the voice of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit works in tandem with the Word, and the relativism of truth has crept into many Christians' approach to the moral absolutes of the Bible. Investigators are increasingly using parapsychology categories in place of biblical categories, being conformed to the world by the allure of false science instead of being transforming agents of culture, as you see in Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. Many investigators affirm the dangers inherent in the use of the Ouija boards, but they fail to see that there is no qualitative difference between soliciting EVPs or other electronic means and a Ouija session. Not all Ouija sessions are frivolous. Some are serious and sincere attempts to communicate with the spirit realm, just as you are doing. Yet we know the horror stories associated with them. Many cases we are called to are rooted in playing with the Ouija boards and the like, and, other, and those of us in deliverance ministries often have to come in after investigations have stirred up the hornet's nest due to the use of occultic techniques. Both Ouija and EVPs address any spirits there to make their presence known. Both are explicit attempts to communicate with the dead, which is clearly forbidden and condemned throughout the Bible. The means of communicating with the spirit realm are mushrooming, but they are equally heinous in God's eyes. The veneer science behind those methods must not be seen as excusing them much less sanctioning them. It is whitewashing wickedness. It is our experience from studying all of the relevant biblical texts that every attempt to support notions common in the paranormal community always commit one or more exegetical or hermeneutical fallacies. Indeed, it's been my experience that the very texts that are appealed to to support paranormal practices and beliefs usually undermine those very beliefs. One that's very commonly appealed to is Mark chapter 6. Without time to go into it, it actually undermines the very beliefs that people think that it teaches. In paranormal seminars, there is frequently what is called phenomenology. But be that as it may, there is a tendency in paranormal um, circles to identify entities in, their, in, in your investigations by your five senses. You identify the phenomena by how they appear or by intuition which is naive from a biblical perspective because if Satan can appear as an angel of light, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, then it would be a snap for him or demons to appear as anything. And we, and I know you too, have seen some really bizarre manifestations. In light of this biblical fact, why do Christian investigators continually attempt to identify entities based on appearance? Sound of their voice, their smells, or some kind of intuition. Why believe the voice of a demon? If they are anything, demons are masters of deception. 
who were there 100 years ago and can mimic all the findings of the historical research. Thus, they have been successful countless times in misguiding investigators into thinking that they have discovered the alleged, quote, deceased human who is causing the problems. Failure to take into account the reality of demons has led many Christians to embrace shameful beliefs and to view the phenomena or the data through distorted lenses. Con uh, contrary to common uh, opinion, there are gradations of sin in Scripture, as well as hell, Romans 2, 5. And Jesus speaks of weightier matters of the law. And occultic sins are weightier matters of the law and are especially heinous in God's eyes. Please see John 19.11, Leviticus 4.2, as well as verse 13, chapter 5, verse 17, Numbers 15.30, Ezekiel 8 verses 6 and 13 and 15, Matthew 5, verse 19, as well as chapters 23, verse 23, and of course Deuteronomy chapter 18. And then I would ask you to reread all of the major prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and so on, and to engage in them is to jeopardize one's eternal destiny. How can you continue doing what you know God hates? The Word says, He who perseveres in obedience to the end will be saved. That's Hebrews 12, which also says, Pursue after holiness without which no one will see the, uh, see the Lord. We fear that many people who profess Christ do not possess Christ. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, Matthew 7, 21. We wonder if you've ever stopped to ask if your spiritual authority is maybe being compromised as a result of your grievous sin. We know ourselves from painful experience that investigating the paranormal causes demonic oppression, whether you realise it or not. So when you go to help someone, you are likely bringing demons with you, which unwittingly infest them further. And without a doubt, your occultic techniques make it worse for the client by opening new demonic doors or making old doors wider. Many of you are hesitant to even mention demons to your clients because it might scare them. But is that wise, since the Bible says that there are only two entities in the spirit realm, good and bad angels, demons, unclean spirits, elemental spirits, these are all synonyms. You know, I responded the exact same way in my first few years as a Christian. I was scared that I would frighten people by telling them that the entities are demons. But eventually I felt God was urging me to tell them the truth, otherwise I'd actually be lying to them. The Bible mentions demons and Satan. It is the truth. And you know, folks will be more scared if they die without knowing this truth or without knowing Christ as Saviour. I myself was really grateful when a Christian told me that those spirits I had spoke, spoken with were actually demons. And as soon as I accepted this, I was desperate to be free of them, scared or not. Guys, if we don't tell them the truth that these are demons, you are really just, in a sense, allowing them to continue to believe a lie. You are lying to them. And by appealing to the notion of earthbound spirits, poltergeist, residual energy. Oh, and by the way, Mark Kahneman is, is writing a book which covers uh, these topics. You are actually telling the client that there is peace when there is no peace. And as we know, false prophets were condemned in the Old Testament for saying that. Plus, in addition, it also destroys biblical hope. Hence, we see no positive purpose behind paranormal investigating as it is practiced today. The clients don't need validation of something they already know is true. They need deliverance and conversion. If you are truly called by God, 
then you may consider deliverance as a vocation. In light of 1 Corinthians 10.31, we can see no redeeming value nor any hope of paranormal investigating bringing glory to God. Indeed, it dishonors God's holy name, and we are called to hollow his name. We affirm that all genuine paranormal activity is demonic activity, as neither holy angels or the Holy Spirit will act mischievously, and angels are our servants, as it says in Hebrews 1.14. And humans immediately go to heaven or hell after they die, as it says in Hebrews 9.27. The, perfect, the perfection of the atonement is at stake regarding the demonic notion of earthbound spirits, and it is one of Satan's most effective lies. If your ultimate authority is the Roman Catholic Church and the teachings of its well-known exorcists, then we gently but firmly state that their view of justification is a false gospel, as you see in Galatians 1. And no human authority must be placed on par with God's word. Purgatory is a direct assault on the singular honor and dignity of the person and work of Christ and his finished work on the cross. There is much more we had wanted to say, but from the depths of our hearts, we beg of you to listen carefully to what we have said, even if it may initially upset you. In summary, even if you persist in believing in earthbound spirits, the Bible clearly says not to attempt communication with the dead. Neither Jesus, nor the early church, nor the disciples communicated with earthbound spirits. In the situation with Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration, they were not earthbound. And Remember again that the disciples did not conduct paranormal investigations or assist deceased spirits in crossing over because our thrice holy omnipotent God and judge reigns over every atom in the cosmos, especially our souls. Ephesians 1 verse 11. We are called to imitate Christ and Jesus himself is the light. Let us point them to him. Our Savior did not have a ministry to the dead, and neither did the apostles. So why do you? They weren't involved in paranormal investigations, so why should you? Certainly this would have been part of the Great Commission if it were true. Focusing your time and energy on paranormal investigating and assisting souls to, quote, cross over is not part of the Great Commission, and you don't have the ability to do it. Thus, we feel you have been distracted from that explicit calling to all believers. We urge you to refocus your energies on reaching out to the lost and making disciples while they may still be found, and helping those who are demonically oppressed by cleansing them and their homes of unclean spirits. God is so gracious and merciful, and he can use you to redirect your focus on reaching the living lost and delivering people from demons. If he can use us toward that end, and he can certainly use you. When Laura Maxwell realized that she was deceived some years ago and shared this with me on, in an interview, and she was deceived by a group of Christians who all believed in the now popular global Christian trend that they were receiving revelation from alleged holy angels, she left that group and saw a deliverance minister. She repented and had demons cast out of her. Even after many years of successful healing and deliverance ministry, Laura, too, found herself being deceived. But she realized that, and she saw help. She shared this in a radio interview, as I said, as we, with me, um, 
on air while we discussed angels. You see, nobody, certainly not us, is above being deceived. Like Laura did, please seek deliverance if it is needed, as we know that many of you are oppressed. We know it. If you have any issues, questions, or whatever, please send any replies to Mark Hunneman at M H U N N E at AOL dot com. That's M and the Mark H is in Harry U N N E at AOL dot com. I was a primary draft of this letter, and Laura and Dana uh, gave invaluable support and insights. It's only proper that you would send me your any issues that you might have. We do intend to produce several short videos in the near future that deal with the, free, the questions that uh, you might have about this. And I've already written one with reference to the question of Old Testament law. Love and a Lamb, Mark A. Hunneman, Master of Divinity, author, deliverance minister, radio guest, and former pastor. Again, you can reach me at archive.aweber.com dot com para world Laura Maxwell BA with honors author TV and radio guest radio host and former spiritualist her site is our spiritual quest dot com and Dana Emanuel author deliverance minister radio guest and former paranormal investigator and her site is exposing the enemy dot com and there are several dozen people who sign this, and they say, in conclusion, the undersigned lovingly call you to put off your pagan occult ways and reaffirm that Jesus' worship extends over every area of life. Seek the Lord while he may be found, and bow before Jesus as your Savior and Lord. Amen.